Hey, Christian, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, Caden, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so honored. I think it's hilarious. A lot of people, I don't know if they know this. Oh, well, you just said the podcast will be out. But the timing of this, I literally was on your podcast last week. I know. It's, you know, we've got a rapport going. I think we continue it. You get Arden on next. I think so, too. I think we just go through the whole Bevere family and just yeah. get all the way through the whole catalog. That'll be like you a should whole get Azzy super... on. It'll be his first podcast ever. Yes, that would you be get a lot of them, like mamas. That might be all you get, but... Do we get a couple dadas or not yet? There's some dadas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's some good. strong representation. I'm sure Arden would like it so a couple dadas. Oh, his face. Like, like when he says mama, he's like, really? We call mama every day. And then now he's yeah. getting dadas and he just lights up. I'm like, see? Uh, it feels I, good. It's got to be the best feeling in the world, honestly, when your kid starts calling you like mom or dad. But honestly, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to have you. It's going to be a lot of fun today. Yeah, let's jump into it. I know. I think it's funny that both of our backgrounds look identical for the listeners. What are you talking about? We're in the same room. Yeah. Yeah, for the listeners, Christian flew all the way here from Nashville, <laughs> Tennessee to come to Pasadena, California to film with us at the You and Me studio. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I was promised good coffee and great hang. So let's see if yeah. those are fulfilled. You get to hang with the whole team and no, we're playing. She is in Nashville. You're in Nashville, right? Um, yeah, we're in Greater Nashville, so technically yeah. Franklin, but so awesome. Tomato, tomato. Well, hey, today we're talking about the question: How do I view myself? Christian's got a really awesome new book coming out called "Break Up What Broke You." Oh, break up with what broke you. Um, how God redeems and rewrites your story, and um, I'm excited to read that. I think it's yeah. going to be awesome. But today we're going to talk a bit about. Um, Some of those concepts in that book um, really help us outline how to view ourselves um, in the image of of Jesus. So um, we're going to read a couple foundational scriptures and then pray, and then we'll get into this combo. How's that sound? Amen. Let's do it. Let's do it. So the the first one that came to mind thinking about answering the question, um, how do I view myself, is Genesis 127. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And in the second verse is Ephesians 4, 24. It says, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And I think uh, through some of the stuff Christian's going to share today, we're going to be able to maybe have some revelation about how we should be viewing ourselves. Whether you're a uh, male or female, I think both of these can apply to your life. So Christian, you want to pray for us and we'll jump in? Absolutely. It'd be my honor. Lord, we just come to you and we say thank you that we get to be made in your image, that we get to revel in just the glory that you possess and that you share um, as your children, as your sons and daughters. We thank you that you are moving here on this earth, whether it be in California or Tennessee or wherever someone is listening that I just pray that you will be magnified through all of our words, that you will be present that your holy spirit will be rich within everyone listening that you will transcend yeah. the waves of technology lord and just have a, a unanimous and uh, undeniable presence in each of yeah. our hearts lord and so we just thank you for this space we ask that your conversations what you want to position in front of your believers honestly god and the questions that you want to answer will be profound and stated in this podcast and i thank you for everyone in the room with Caden, for all his team and we just say thank you and amen Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm hey, grab I my love... Bible, too. I feel like I need it after reading this. Yeah, scripture. get your Bible. Come on. <laughs> I, like, get immediately convicted because I don't have mine with me either. <laughs> pulls up pulls up Bible app immediately. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I love this question. Um, how do we view ourselves? Because I think in our culture, especially, we are having a little bit of a crisis of identity across the mm-hmm. board. Um, I think even in the way that we view ourselves in terms of shame, guilt, regret, how that shapes us, maybe even like past trauma in our lives, decisions we've made. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you for one of our first questions is how can we silence um, those, those voices and those thoughts of shame and guilt that kind of want to help identify um, ourselves and how we view ourselves? And then how do we learn from those as well? Mm. I'm so glad you're jumping into this because the whole book was almost called Silencing Shame. Shame is such a, it's an ever present thing in our world that if we don't understand how to learn from it and move past it, we're going to be in shackles forever. And it's really easy to 
kind of manipulate it to something we just feel or something that's under the surface. But what I've seen in my own life is the enemy loves isolation. Yeah. It is the breeding ground for any tactic, any foothold that he wants to have in your life. So Absolutely. I'm really passionate about talking about this. Uh, not so we can just sit in our shame and our trauma. I think that is one big caveat that we need to start out with. Our generation is good at saying we are broken, which is a preface of the book, first chapter, which wasn't fun to write. Like, hey, thanks for getting this book. We're all broken. Yeah, <laughs> so, we should have got that in chapter two. Lay a little bit better yeah, foundation yeah, yeah. in the first chapter. Um, but I just start out like, hey, guys, we have to first understand this. Because if we don't understand what breaks us, we are never able to be whole. And yeah. what breaks our generation is uh, sin, Absolutely. distance from God. It's putting ourselves first, having to have control. All mm-hmm. these things that are very flesh-natured and bound to happen to the best of us. So what we do is we need to understand who we are. Yeah. I just like to say that shame is the aftermath or an inability to separate what we've done from who we are. That's now. Good. Today we see people that are like, well, this is how I feel. This is what I've done. This is who I am. Don't you dare change me. Mm-hmm. But knowing we all have either tendencies to glorify God or glorify self. Yeah. If we glorify self, we're going to resurrect things that are not supposed to be tied to who we are and are not going to be overcomers. We're not going to be powerful. But if we glorify God, he's going to show us the best of who we are and who we might not even know we are yet wow. because we haven't walked it out. Like We need that time to journey with him. Yeah. So I think we have to, well, enable to break up with shame. We have to know who we are. And to know who we are, we have to know our creator. It's really as simple as that. That's so good. I loved how you like touched a little bit on like isolation, how like the enemy attacks. Scripture talks about how Satan is, is um, walking the earth like a roaring lion, ready to devour. And I don't know if you've ever seen how a lion hunts, but a lion doesn't hunt a herd of gazelles. He just hunts one. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes he hunts the weakest one, the one that's been separated from the pack, the one that he knows that he can attack. And so I love that idea of how how he uses isolation to really like hunt Christians. And how he does that is he drowns them in shame. He drowns them in regret. He drowns them in isolation. What would you Mm -hmm. say is like a tip um, for maybe beating isolation or getting in community? Or what would you say or, or be your tip for that? Yeah. It's so important to me to understand that the nuances within scripture, everything, even just the verses you started out with, like we can break those down to the very words and see the significance within it. But we talk about, you know, the enemy is a roaring lion, but then God is also the lion of Judah. So what we see is intimidating. We actually have the power and the authority to overcome often with the very same anecdotes that scare us. So if the enemy's coming after you in isolation, Take that time of isolation and make it a time of prayer and worship with God. Mm -hmm. If he's coming after you because of your shame, use shame to actually glorify God. And I say that because I saw it's Isaiah 41, I believe. It talks about there is a double portion blessing. And this, Caden, is the biggest thing that helps me overcome shame. Walked in it for countless, countless years from when I was walking in sin and even when I found freedom, and even when I was walking in promise. Yeah. Shame kept coming up because it was a foothold tied to the things I still believed about myself, any area that I hadn't fully opened to God or shared with others, that isolation factor again. Yeah. But the scripture says that he, instead of shame, will give you a double portion. So anytime I felt that shame coming back to attack me, I would sit there and I asked God, and He re- this really was a revelation. It wasn't just so easy, but I can share about it now because I've been walking in it. He would show me, anytime I felt shame, remember that I've brought you free from that. So if wow. you feel inadequate, you're having remembrances of, gosh, why did I do this? How did I get there? I can't be walking in your blessing because I messed up so much. No, no, no. Remember, wow, God, you brought me from that all the way to here. And who el- who knows where else we're going? Like, praise God. I have the double portion of being free and remembering the power that he holds. That is bigger than any shame, any regret, any isolation. So that would be my yeah. biggest thing. Like, take whatever you feel is fearful, even hiding it, and use it as actually the weapon to counteract it. No, that's so good. I liked your point when you said, like, um, I'm going to paraphrase you, but basically you're giving the point, like, not all isolation can be bad. Like, you think about what Jesus did. He often went to go be alone with his father. Mm-hmm. And I think we can be isolated, and that may be when the enemy wants to attack us. But if we're isolated and then get, like, incubated in the presence of Jesus— 
then yeah. I think that's totally it's a totally different thing. Like you go, oh, okay, what the enemy wanted to use for evil in my isolation, Jesus actually used it for incubation to grow me and to allow me to walk in more fullness and more freedom and the potential yeah. of who and who He's called me to be. And you can start to view yourself in that way, like, oh, I'm not isolated because um, I'm going to be devoured. I'm isolated because I'm actually spending time with my Father. Mm-hmm. And that those seasons, I've had those seasons where like I felt isolated. But I knew God had isolated me because he needed time to to weed things out and spend time with me and and foster intimacy. Yeah. And I think those times can be really powerful. Mm-hmm. I also liked what you said when you said that, like, um, how Satan, they talk, in Scripture talks about he's roaring around like a lion. But the Scripture talks about how, how Jesus is the Lion of Judah. Yeah. It's a really, it's like, interesting. It's always imitating Christ. It's an imitation. Yeah. So, like, the Scripture talks about, well, well uh, Satan's roaring around like a lion. AKA he's pretending to be a lion, but he's actually not. Mm-hmm. Other then you look at scripture and says that that God is the lion of Judah is the lion. Mm-hmm. So if you understand that revelation, I think you can understand like when the enemy is trying to come to devour you, you actually have authority over that. Jesus has already come to conquer your shame. Mm-hmm. Holy Spirit lives and dwells inside of you, and you can live out of that authority to go, Satan, get out of here. Yeah. You're not actually a lion. I'm exposing you. I know who you are. Yeah, you're, you're not. not a lion. You're literally yeah. an alley cat. Get out of here, dude. Like, <laughs> you're just more like a lion. So I think right. those are, are really powerful thoughts, for sure. Yeah. I have a whole chapter around half-truths and, and partial lies, because Whoa. that's exactly what the enemy does, is he manipulates and tweaks not evil things, but good things. He copies Whoa. God. He copies the Word. That's the whole tactic he used to um, tempt Jesus in the wilderness. He's like, oh, if you can do this, here's a scripture. I'm going to manipulate it. I'm going to pervert it, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's so, it's just tantalizing. And he does the same tactic with David, with multiple people in the Bible. And I think he's doing it to you and I and people listening of, well, are you you really free? Are you Mm. not? You're going to be bound to shame forever. It's like, no, no, no. If we know the word and we know who the truth is, the originator of truth, we can see through those lies so much clearer. Absolutely. I, it makes me like think of that picture of um, like horses. People can train horses when they get off their horses. They can like um, wrap their reins around like their stall or whatever um, to like keep a horse tied to where it's supposed to be. Like basically when they park it. I like don't know anything about horses <laughs> clearly, but like when they like park it, they can keep it there. But after a certain amount of time, they actually no longer have to like tie a knot over the um, over where they like leave the horse, they just have mm-hmm. to throw the reins over close to something, and the horse just thinks, "Oh, this is where I stay." And I think like Satan does that to us. Like, no, Jesus came, He conquered your sh- your shame, He conquered your sin nature, you're a new creation in Christ. But then our patterns and what Satan has done makes us think like, "Oh no, we still have to stay in this stall," but mm-hmm. we aren't tied down to it anymore. And yeah, I think someone, just, yeah, someone needs to come and go. Hey, why are you still standing here? This you're not even tied to this. Mm-hmm. Like, why do you still have the chains on? They fell off when Jesus died on the cross. That's I think so like that's good. like a really powerful um, little like anecdote to help you kind of understand like this idea of like shame and what has already been done for you. Mm-hmm. There's a scripture, and I'm forgetting the exact reference. I want to say it's First John. Mm, maybe we can you. put this in the show notes. Yeah, it's you. in the yeah. Bible. I know that yeah. it talks about how the wicked hate the light, and so they hide from it. And when wow. I read it. Okay, and I was like, oh, Matt, can you Google I'm that verse wicked. and tell us where it's at? <laughs> yeah. The wicked. Help this. The wicked. The wicked hating the light. It's, I believe light. it's First John. Okay. But it says essentially the wicked hate the light. And when I read it, I was like, oh, yeah. Well, of course I hate the light. I'm wicked. I'm shameful. Wow. I'm unclean in God's eyes. But when I looked up wicked in Hebrew, I believe it's Rasha. And it actually means guilty. So what I learned in digesting and digesting and sitting on that verse is, we are guilty and we're keeping ourselves in prison to our shame and that isolation. Like you're saying about the horse, we might not even actually be bound to something, but we're just keeping ourselves in a stall, in a cell, whatever area you want to put in there. And it says that when we come into the light, we see that it's actually freeing, liberating, and we can understand what's darkness and what's light. So getting out of that cell and like coming to God, I think that's the hardest thing with shame is we think we're no longer worthy or invited, and so we yeah. just stay. Like you said, yeah. there's really, he can just make us think we're dirty, we're unclean, and he doesn't have to do, he doesn't have to tie us up. Just makes us sit in no. that thinking. No, and it's crazy because it's like wild how much thinking can control everything you do in your life. 
like mm-hmm. what you think and what you process. I forget what verse it is. I might make Matt look it up again. But <laughs> What's up with us in references? Today? I don't know. I'm that guy. I'm that guy though. I'm the guy that's like, it's Proverbs something, you know, like, yeah, yeah. but there's a verse that says, be careful what you think your thoughts control your life. Mm-hmm. I think it's in Proverbs, but um, it's wild because it's crazy how much our thoughts and our shame have that come from our mind have so much power over what is happening in our lives and mm-hmm. how we are able to connect with Jesus and have an intimate relationship with him, which leads into living in fullness and freedom and beating things like shame and, and heartache and, and um, all the things you really you address in your book. Is it in Proverbs? Proverbs 4.23 is the verse. We're going to put all this in the go. show notes so that we just, you guys can look it up if you need to. It's not a heresy, guys. We promise. Yeah, we promise we're not, we're not heresies. Um, but, hey, I think one of the other things I want to talk about today is um, this idea of comparison. I think there's a mm-hmm. big um, problem that we're coming across in this generation, younger generations. Yeah. I'd say even some older of this idea of comparison. Um, and I think you can blame whatever you want to blame. You can blame social media. You could blame, uh, yeah, social media. And I think what ends up happening is that you hear from a lot of people like, oh, hey, I'm off social media right now because I just, I don't know, it's just not good for my mental health and I just end up, I can't find joy or I just get competitive or I can't. I want to talk a little bit about what comparison is, how the enemy uses it, and then what we can do to stop that from like locking us into those patterns of of negative self-thinking because of comparison. Yeah, uh, comparison is such a trap. I think even more specifically for women, not say it only affects women, but we carry it really deeply. And again, the isolation factor of thinking, well, I'm the only one that struggles with this. And uh, so-and-so is doing this. Uh, you know, Caden's got his podcast. He's doing his thing. He's living life. He's He must not struggle with being close with God, right? Like we get into these comparison loops, which is harmful for us and how we see ourselves, but also the filling in the blanks, I think is what's really detrimental to how we see ourselves is just thinking he's got it right he's got it made uh mm-hmm. social media for that is a big catalyst because we're only really seeing highlight reels i love that we are getting more of a vulnerable and authentic scope in the last few years i think that's been helpful yeah but we need to understand that comparison is bred in how we see ourselves and where we get our worth wow. i think we need to one understand that there are similarities between Christ because he loves us all. He sees us all as, you know, reflections of him, even as you're saying it made in the image of God, but there are also unique specifications. And I think of how everything in society right now is like, well, you get an honorable mention, you get an award, you get this. And there's no room for differentiation. To me, comparison is um, living on that because we think, well, we have to compete with the person beside us, but it's like, well, why can't, why can't God do a work in someone that he's doing a different work in someone else? Like it doesn't, I wrote this in the book, but someone else's gifts aren't robbing you of yours. Like their blessings don't mean that you don't get the next thing. And I'm raising a child right now. We're, we're entering some of the tantrums and I just think we're, we kind of act like toddlers sometimes of like, oh, well, so-and-so got that and I didn't, but like, can we understand that like God's timing is so miraculous that Mm -hmm. if he does the thing, he's going to do it for you. If he does it different, then it's going to be the right method for you. I had this one dream, Caden, that I think really just shifted so much of my gaze around comparison. And I was in the Louvre Museum, which is in Paris, France, if anyone needs reference. I did. And <laughs> did. Matt did too. Yeah. yeah. I have no idea what it was. Yeah. Sick. It is in France, which is in Europe, which is on the oh, other side of the world. That's in Germany, yes. right? Mm, it's close. It's okay, close. Sick. We'll do a geography lesson uh, next podcast. Yeah. It's sick. But I was in the Louvre Museum, which houses so many incredible paintings. I haven't been to it yet, but it's on the bucket list. And uh, I walk in and no one's there. Like, I get this place all to myself. It's amazing. And then out of the corner, this guide comes up, and he just welcomes me, and probably in a French accent, which I will not repeat now to save myself some embarrassment. I think we need to hear it in a French accent. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, gosh. I just don't think we have time for that. <laughs> uh, but this guide comes up to me, and he's like, congratulations. You're going to go home with a painting today, which these paintings are worth millions of dollars. Like, they're the, the creme de la creme, the best paintings uh throughout history. And so I'm walking and he's like, you get to take home a painting, but you need to be really careful which one you pick. And I was like, okay, yeah. Like he does wisdom. 
let's start looking around and I'm scoping and looking and all the pictures, like which one am I going to take home? And I see the Mona Lisa and instantly I was like, oh, that's my painting. You're coming home with me, girlfriend, let's go. And I come up to the guide and I was like, I'm gonna take home the Mona Lisa. Like, this is my painting. Thank you so much. And he's like, oh, that's great. But before you do, I want you to finish going through the museum and looking at the other paintings just to make sure. I was like, okay, like, cool. I'll go look at the other paintings, but like, this is my one, put my name on it. Uh, I got dibs on that (laughs) and I start looking around. And if you know anything about the Mona Lisa, it's a very dark painting. Mm -hmm. She's not particularly smiling. Uh, It's a little bit dull in color and it can be lackluster to some viewers. And so I start looking and all these other paintings have way more color. They have gold embellishments. They have things that my painting doesn't have. And I start to diminish my choice and what mine has to offer. So I finish looking around and the guide comes up to me and he says, are you still happy with what you picked? And I thought about it and I was like, I'm no, I'm not happy with what I have because all these other paintings have what I don't. And he looked me dead in the eye and he said, if you give up this painting, you're giving up the most famous painting in the world. So I wake up, get my phone like we always do, which you probably shouldn't do, but I had to check. And I was like, what is the most famous painting in the world? And it was Mona Lisa. And I felt like in that moment, I realized how valuable of a thing we have that we devalue by looking at others and comparing and contrasting. Mm, Like how intricate is each body of art and unique expression, each masterpiece that God Mm. creates that we devalue when we just sit and compare it. That is insane. First of all, I'm comparing myself because I don't get visions like that, dude. What the? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm messing. That's amazing. Now I you think can. It, it's a powerful, it's a really, really powerful revelation that I believe, obviously, the Holy Spirit gave you. But um, I think I wish more people would understand that God's not asking them to be anybody but who he's made them to be. Mm-hmm. And I think we often are looking, like you said, we're trying to be somebody else. We're comparing ourselves to somebody else. We're we're going, well, I I feel called to go this way, so let me look at all the people that went this way and let me try and just be the, as close to them and look just like them that I could because they're all going mm-hmm. the same. This must be the formula. They must be doing it right. Yeah, They exactly. must be doing it right or doing it better for me or, you know, like, oh, they're getting this and they're getting that. And um, I think it, it would be more – it would be so powerful if we could understand that, like like you said, God has enough for all of us. Like I think we, we mm-hmm. get in this mindset that somehow if – if you if your podcast blows up, Christian, my, I guess mine can't. Well, how come hers blew up? Mine didn't. She, she's mm-hmm. stealing my view. Like, God has more than enough for every single person to walk in the fullness of what He's called them to. Scripture mm-hmm. says that it, it's going to be more than we could ask, think, or imagine. And what's the verse that He's going to press down, shaking together, and overflowing? Yeah, start up for Matt, a good measure. Yeah, I'd like. He wants to do that in your life, which Mm -hmm. means he has more than enough for every single one of us. And we start to, I think it's actually, and this might be harsh, but I think it's actually small minded to think that the God of the universe who created everything doesn't have enough for you and for me. Mm -hmm. Like he only has enough for them and I must lose out. Or he's not creative enough to do it differently. Absolutely. Like, like to think that, oh, God has a formula for how he wants to do something in my life. Mm -hmm. And if I don't reach this formula, then I'm not doing it correct. Like, I think that's, that's a lie. I think Mm -hmm. there's, God wants to do something specific and unique in each of our lives that we don't allow him to do when we try to look like somebody else. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great, I share that sentiment. I wish more people would understand that. And I think we get more expressions, um, of his glory in new ways. Absolutely. I, I want to ask this question. What do you think, I mean, we're talking a bit about like viewing ourselves image. What do you think is a biblical, like a healthy biblical self image? Like how mm-hmm. do you think men, women, how do you think we should be viewing ourselves? Well, I am a deep feeler. So I tend to gravitate towards, uh, uh, David, King David's <laughs> expressions. So yeah. like the Psalms are my thing. I'm like, Oh yeah. He feels that so loved. Oh yeah, so he feels feely. so good. He so was. Feely, yeah. And I think in a really healthy way. And it, sometimes when we look, another emphasis to do deep dives is like we read something as like, woe is me, but it's actually an articulation. Like even, oh gosh, what is it? Psalm 22, I think is um, symbolism of the cross 
So he's like, oh, I'm so abandoned. I'm so tormented. And people are like, man, David's really mentally unwell. But yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was talking about Jesus dying on the cross. So there's that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yay for deep feelings. But uh, I gravitate <laughs> towards him. Feelings could be prophetic people. That's all we're saying. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. You don't get the dreams unless <laughs> yeah, yeah. you not like taking notes. Dude, how do we get these your dreams? <laughs> <laughs> um, but hey, what is it? Acts? Young young men will dream dreams? Yep. Or old men will dream dreams? Isn't it? Someone says it. But King David had a really healthy way of understanding that he was made in the image of God and like celebrating that. So... Um, I think having a positive self-image is celebrating the things that we bestow and tying them back to God. When we have a celebration that's tied to ourself, it can be really easily inflated and rise and fall on how it's received. But when we celebrate, kind of what we're talking about, that incubation is at an isolation moments of like, okay, God, I feel creative. Yeah. I feel like you have put a power of words. To me, I do not feel like a great speaker. So coming on podcast is really fun. Uh, really it. reliant You're on him. <laughs> You're right now. Um, but writing, I was like, oh, I feel alive in this. And so yeah. celebrating that and leaning into it as a talent, but still relying on him. I'm like, okay, I'm glorifying God in my, in my image and my quality and my talents. Um, and, and then with beauty, doing it in a way where it's like, well, God, how have you made me beautiful? What do you want to glorify in me? It may not look like the girl beside me. It yeah. may not always feel like a 10 out of 10, but I do know that you have given me um, youth. You've given me health. Like, how can I celebrate and glorify that? So I think going back to a biblical mindset is knowing that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. We too, the fullness of who we are is one started with him, created by him and ends with him. So in all things, in all ways, in all manner, every day, how can we continue to point to that in a way that's not self-inflating or better than anyone else? Again, we're talking about comparison. Don't say, well, I feel pretty or I, I took a photo of my friends and like she looked bad, but I looked good. Just know like, oh, gosh, I'm radiating joy from God. Yeah. And it sounds Christianese, but you can tell, like you can tell when you meet someone and like, sure, they might be pretty, they might be talented, but they're just radiant with joy. Like yeah. that's the kind of image and bestowment i want to radiate absolutely yeah you can meet somebody and you go like man you can just see jesus in their eyes mm -hmm. and i think like that often it comes from they carry a revelation of like where their joy comes from where their validation yeah. comes from because i think when you go to comparison and you talk about comparison or negative self-image and it's easy to allow the world to identify what your image is because it comes from where you're valued mm -hmm. so like it's easy to um have your image or even where you get your self-worth to be like your looks or be like what you do for a living or how much money you make or any of those things because it's what you've allowed like your value to be built and, and um, come from. And mm -hmm. I just think like comparison comes out the window when the only thing you're comparing yourself to is like, hey, my value comes from Jesus and does my life look like his? Yeah. I think like that's the only like healthy comparison. I think it's like, well, how did Jesus live his life? Oh, he did that? Okay, am I doing that? No? Okay, let me do that. Like, mm -hmm. I think you, like, you learn those revelations, allow Holy Spirit to, like, manifest those fruit out of your life. I think that's a very, the only healthy comparison that you can really have. I think every other comparison is going to be, is going to be negative. Even the comparison of, like, I was listening to this comedy stand-up the other day, and the guy was like, he's like, yeah, comparison, like, sucks when, like, people are going on trips and you're, like, in the office. But comparison feels great when, like, someone let, you can compare yourself to someone less than you and then yeah. and gas yourself up. Yeah. But, like comparison either way is toxic it's not good but i think if you can compare yourself and what to jesus what i mean is like if you can self-reflect does my life look and mirror the life of jesus i think that's a healthy comparison mm -hmm. to be like hey yeah. i, I want to look i want to look like jesus does my life look like jesus or does my life look like this dude i follow on instagram that i want to be like mm -hmm. you know that's, so i think it's real um sorry did i cut you off no, I was just saying it's real. It's good. Okay, yeah. It's real good. I think for the last thought for us, um, I don't want to take too much of your time. We're already sitting around 30 minutes. But um, the last the last tip I have, I think, or the last question I have, we, we've talked a lot about self-image. We've talked about comparison, talked about shame, talked about guilt. Do you just have some tips to encourage some listeners on how to allow God to, like, redeem and restore those areas in their life? What are some things they can do, some things they can step in, maybe some mindsets they can carry out of this podcast mm -hmm. that can encourage them in that? Yeah, it's my biggest heart right now is to see people 
break up from their past. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't, you know, we hear breakups as like a liberation uh, anthem where you're like playing Taylor Swift and like <laughs> doing spa days, whatever it looks like. But that. I'll be honest I, with you. Taylor Swift's not on the redemption playlist for me. <laughs> Old school Taylor Swift, yes. New Taylor Swift, I could leave it on the wayside. Debatable, yeah. I'm just saying, I'm saying. Someone just tuned out on the podcast because I said that. Yeah, uh, they said Taylor Swift and they said, click. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. But um, that posture of, heart, of breakups being a form of liberation, I think, is something that we carry. And part of why I wrote the title because... We have to, one, identify our past and what we're coming from in order to have this breakthrough moment. Yeah. So what I want to challenge people with is like sit in your thoughts, do that incubation method, um, maybe probe certain areas of your life, whether it be childhood or like certain habits you're doing and just like ask God, is this fulfilling me? Is this of you? If there's anything that feels like it's festering inside, it's uncomfortable, you want to like skim past it. That might be a good thing to explore. Like, is there a root there? Yeah. And in order to redeem it, you have to say, okay, God, I fully acknowledge. Like for me, I get really personal in the book. Hmm. (laughs) So if you want to know me better or want to relate to someone, uh, go pick it up. But I get really vulnerable about the things I believed about myself and how that led to certain actions. And I think our generation is really good about doing the first part of like, I felt unloved. I felt betrayed. I felt less than, but we haven't quite connected the dots of, okay, but how do I get out of that? Yeah. yeah, We get out of it by owning it. So it felt so painful to say, I messed up, God, I did this. Like I'm continually choosing things other than you. Like I'm looking at guys' attentions more than I'm looking at yours, but owning that allowed me to move past it. And it allowed me to break through, break free from shame. And what I want to encourage anyone listening is just know the difference between conviction and shame. Wow. Because they mm-hmm. feel interchangeable, but they're actually not. And they're not feelings, they're directions. And I was reading That's Jeremiah cool. 39. And, uh, you know, a lot of the Old Testament can just feel like a bunch of names and a bunch of places I can't pronounce and mm-hmm. not really sure <laughs> the symbolism a lot of, of the it. Law. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But um, I was reading how Jeremiah was warning the kings of Judah before the Babylonian attack. And he just kept reminding them again and again, hey, you need to, you actually need to go to the Chaldeans. And like, you need to do this in order to um, be free, to have your life back. But they were so set on, but no, I'm a king. Like, I deserve to be here. Like, this is who I am. And throughout the chapters, it's talking about the kings were consulting Jeremiah in secret. Like they were doing all this stuff privately. So I would tell someone, get in that incubation, you know, have your time alone, have time to really process and hear the word of the Lord. But they chose to ignore. And what Jeremiah reminded them of, I have my Bible up here, so we're not having to get Matt to get the reference on this one. (laughs) But it's Jeremiah 38. From all the Googling. (laughs) Um, Jeremiah 38, 20. Jeremiah said, you shall not be given to them. Obey now the voice of the Lord and what I say to you, and it shall be well with you and your life shall be spared. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the vision which the Lord has shown to me. And we, you know, that's a really scary vision. So we won't scare people. (laughs) But what I got from it is, you know, shame and conviction, they're going to come through the same thing. Like Caden, let's say you were out drinking, like having sex with people all the time. And like the Lord's telling you, Hey, come back to me, draw near to my heart. Let my heart be one with you. And you continue to ignore it. Like eventually that conviction is going to subside and it's going to be shame because you're continually mm-hmm. choosing the things that are not right for you. That's and good. it sits unwell with you because yeah. like everything we do leads to a cause and effect. But what conviction does, and I wish more people understood this, conviction is such a grace filled gentleman posture because it's a yeah. continual reminder of like, I've created you for more, for better. I'm not shaming you because you've fallen less. I'm not shaming you because you wanted to be loved. I'm calling you and convicting you back to my heart. So yeah. knowing the difference and like the gesture of love, the extended hand posture that that is of God is so freeing. And it's, I think, not talked about enough. So that would be my, my last little tidbit. That's so good. Yeah, I think it's important. Like, I think conviction and then like repentance, it's not punishment. I think sometimes you can get in that posture of being like, oh man, I'm feeling convicted and the Lord must just be so mad at me or like I need mm-hmm. to repent and it's just like, oh, uh, but it's like, f- it's freedom. Like mm-hmm. having that conviction is like, shows like the, the kindness of Jesus to be able to like 
convict you to go, hey, this is just not the best thing for you. Like, mm-hmm. You're selling yourself short to this. Like, I have so much more for your life than this. Like, this thing you're doing, I'm not mad at you. I just need you to know that, like, you're selling out. Like, I have so much more. I think, mm-hmm. and, then, and then repentance is, like, the, the opportunity to step into freedom. It's like, hey, yeah. I know you did that. I know you walked in this. I knew you were convicted. And now here's an opportunity to turn away from that and step back into the presence of God and back into the, the mindset of salvation and freedom. So, yeah. hey, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. That was so good. I love that so me. much. Yeah, it was a blast. I think it's, it's funny. The, uh, it sounds like we're doing a podcast every week now. <laughs> well, I guess yours? we'll see you next week. Am I coming on yours next week? Is that how we're doing that? <laughs> you know, I think Arden and I are starting a podcast, so maybe we'll have you on that one. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll fly, to, I'll fly to Nashville for that one. There we go. I got to be in person for that one. But hey, thanks for coming on the podcast. For the listeners, you need to know Christian has got a book coming out here. It's releasing August 15th, correct? Mm-hmm, correct. And it's called Break Up With What Broke You, How God Redeems and Rewrites Your Story how encouraging so if you liked any of the things we talked about in this podcast christian goes into way more in depth on all these topics and all these things in her book and um i heard there's a sale is there a sale there is a sale if you pre-order with baker bookhouse you get the book 40 percent off which is wild Dang. we love a sale so people go there i'll link it on my instagram page too if you're like i need the link yeah uh we'll put the link if you send me the link We'll put the link in the description of the podcast so you guys don't even have to waste time. Just go click the link and then buy the book. I'm going to buy the book. Uh, I'm going to make Matt buy the book. (laughs) Maybe we're going to do a little like we'll do a little like a book study on the book. You know what? It's only been guys that I've had conversations with reading it right now, which is so funny, but I'm here for it. Yeah, because it is. The book, it like really, really, really talks from like a women's perspective towards women as well. But we have stuff to learn. So much yeah. to learn. This right? is helping you for your your future marriage, guys. You're yeah, welcome. totally, absolutely. I expect One to be in your vows. One than the other, but no <laughs> need to say who who. Okay, hey Christian, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for being such a good friend. I love y'all. I uh, love the Bevere family, and I'm just grateful for you guys. So thanks for spending time with us at Questions with Caden, uh, listeners. We love y'all, and we'll see you next week.